Welcome to another episode of Purchase to Profits. I'm Seth Ferguson. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss our daily interviews with successful real estate investors. And I've put together the top seven key market drivers I look at when analyzing a real estate market. Go to sethferguson.org to download your free copy. Our guest today has been involved in commercial real estate since 2006 and has grossed over $52 million by purchasing, renovating, and flipping multifamily properties. Nathan Tabor joins us today. Nathan, welcome to Purchase Profits. It's great to have you on the show. Seth, great to be here. Thanks, thanks for having me on your show. Yeah, no, I'm really looking forward to this. So let's jump right in and uh, talk about your real estate goals right now. So my real estate goals where I'm, I'm right now, I'm in the, the Winston-Salem, North Carolina area. Yeah. Um, I am a flipper of multifamily has been my you know, deal since 2006. So you know, what I'm doing right now is I'm looking at various deals, but you know, anybody who's slightly involved in real estate right now, as hot as it is, you know, finding that deal to flip where somebody you know, hasn't already increased the numbers drastically has been harder. So traditionally what I do is in the upswing like this, I sell my complexes and in the downswing I buy, renovate and hold to the next upswing. Yeah. So most of my real estate now is I do a lot of consulting and coaching. Um, I'm also a real estate broker in the state of North Carolina. So uh, that has been my, you know, helping people, you know, through syndication processes or buying properties or selling properties is my biggest focus. I'm still looking at deals, but they're just really, for me, they're really hard to find right now because of my numbers. Yeah. So it, it would be safe to say you are a net seller these days. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, do, you ha do you have a general rule of thumb of how much of your portfolio you'd like to sell off? Like, do you say, okay, well, I'll, I'll sell off 40% in the upswing? So I'm a chronic flipper. Okay. I, I don't hold property for any longer than I have to. I am always buying, renovating, and selling. Yeah. So, like right now, I don't have any. Oh, I've got a, a 12 unit complex that I work with a nonprofit. So it's mine, but they've had it for six years. So I help them, but it's a transitional housing for, for homeless folks. Yeah. So I don't sell it, but I've sold off all my other properties in the last two years through this upswing. Cause, you know, when you're in a, you know, a deal 30, 35,000, 40 a door and somebody's willing to pay 55 or 60, it's hard not to sell. Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you very much. And then you collect your check. Yeah. And then just hold, wait till the, the economy goes down and then people who have overpaid and they're losing money, they're going to sell. Yeah. I, and they're going to sell at a great discount because the properties aren't worth what they paid, but they also didn't do the renovations right. So now they've got two problems, their cash flow and cap rates off but their renovations weren't done right. So the property, they're going to be selling these properties for, you know, they paid 45, 50, 60 a door. They'll be selling them for 15, 20, 25 a door. Yeah, no, that, that, that's exactly right. And how did you get in, involved in flipping these multifamily properties? Because most people, when we talk about flipping, it's all about the, the single family and, and, the, and the really small properties. In a very odd way, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had businesses from nutraceutical products, uh, soy products, to send a billion emails, I've built 500 plus websites, um, had a used car lot, a buy here, pay here car lot, sold 8,000 yeah. cars in 11 years. And a gentleman walked in my office in 2006 and said, hey, I have an 18 unit apartment complex. Do you know anybody who wants to buy an apartment complex? And at that point, I'd, I literally had bought my house. I had not attended a real estate class had never really even considered real estate. Now my dad growing up, he was a painter and he had flipped uh, probably like three little $30,000 houses just kind of here and there. But I mean, I was like seven, eight, nine when he did it. Yeah. yeah. And I ran the guy's numbers and I was like, you know, when you're in, in you know, entrepreneurial and you're starting businesses and selling them numbers or something you've got to learn. So I was like, well, I mean, if it's, you know, this much and the interest is that much, the payments this much and they're collecting this much, sounds like a pretty good deal. So yeah. I went to five banks that I'd done business with in other businesses, they all said no. The six banks said yes. And so I ended up buying it, uh, bought another 12 unit behind it and eight and a half months later, sold the 30 units and made $223,000. Wow. So, so 
there's something to this. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's great. And what I find fascinating is there's, there are so many people, I, I'm sure people talk to you all the time, same with me, where they, they say they want to get into real estate, but then two, three, four years later, they still haven't taken any action. But you, yeah. without any education in real estate, you jumped right in. Uh, so what, what's, what's the differentiating factor there between you taking action, whereas these other people, they, they research and sit on the sidelines forever? Well, there's, you get into these mindsets, and I, I, I've done it in my own life and other businesses, that, oh, I need to know everything before I get into it. Yeah. Or I don't have what I need to do to do it. And when you find yourself in that mindset, then you're not ever going to, you're not going to get out of it because yeah. I don't ever have all the tools. I don't ever have all the resources. I don't ever have all the educations for any relationship I do. I mean, you doing your podcast, you know, you've got a successful podcast, but you don't know everything about podcasts. Absolutely you not. <laughs> podcast world. You don't have the best camera. You don't have the best lights. You don't have, because you never would. I mean, yeah. as soon as you buy a new camera, six months later, another one's coming out. Yep, that's right. Gotta, at some point, you just got to go do it and find coaches or mentors or partners or vendors who can come along and, and start filling in the holes that you don't know. Yeah. And so for me on that, on the real estate and, and, and other things, is just kind of getting out there and doing it. And people look at multifamily and I go around, I've got a you know, course online and, and the coaching consulting and go speak and people are like, oh, well, you know, I've been flipping houses for 10 years, but I don't know if I could ever get into multifamily. And I'm like, it's just like 10 houses stacked on top of each other or 50. I mean, the numbers are the same, yeah. but there's this one little thing hanging out there called a cap rate and they, it like baffles them or scares them, but a cap rate's really easy. It's not a hard thing to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it, you, you hit the nail right on the head. And what, what I found even with myself, you know, you just have to have the confidence in your own abilities to figure it out as you go. Uh, because like you said, you'll never be a hundred percent ready. Like most people, I, even with the podcast, when I, when I first started the show, I was in no way or in no way, shape or form prepared for podcasting, but you just have to do it and, uh, and bite the bullet. Yeah. I mean, the first podcast you release, the quality, the show notes and all of that, I mean, you got to go back and laugh. I mean, I do a podcast on the, on the ministry side and I go back and look at my first podcast and I'm like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. What was I thinking? Right. Yeah. Oh, that same thing with people and their deals, right? You know, sure. your first deal is not going to be your best deal, but at least it's a deal. Yeah. Right. At least it's a deal. And that's what I tell people that, yeah, you want to have a, a $2 million or $20 million portfolio of real estate, but you got to start at the 50,000 or hundred thousand or 500,000 or whatever. And people are like, well, how, where should I start? And it unfortunately comes down to well, how much money do you have or how much can you raise? Yeah. Cause in a commercial deal, it's roughly 20% down. Mm -hmm. So if you can raise $20,000, go find a hundred thousand dollar deal. Yeah. And people yep. are like, oh, well, apartments are really expensive. Well, multifamily is technically, and some people argue about this, but anything that's not a single family, duplex, quadplex, eightplex, twelveplex, you know, there are apartments out there that aren't two million dollars. There are apartment complexes that you can get into that have 10 units that'll be two hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly it. And so like with yourself and as you've built your business, um, have you developed any routines or rituals um, that have helped make you successful? Yeah, so one of the biggest is relationships, uh, finding deals. So, you know, especially in markets like this, uh, but even, you know, in a down market, the real estate is such a hot thing now. There's so many, you know, podcasts and courses and conferences of, hey, real estate, something that you can use for long-term investing in the way to make money. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, I find deals, you know, either on MLS or LoopNet or CoStar or 10X or any of those. But the way I find my best deals is by having relationships with brokers, with um, HVAC people, appraisers, attorneys whoever that comes in and says, Hey, I know about this 30 unit or 10 unit or 50 unit or hundred unit that they're trying to sell, but it's not been listed yet. Yeah. 
So the thing I do that I spend a lot of my time on is just reaching out to folks and saying, hey, remember I'm looking for, and I define my niche. So I'm always saying I'm looking for class C, high deferred maintenance, high deferred occupancy, uh, I mean, uh, high, high occupancy issues. Um, if you have something in and around the, the Winston-Salem, Greensboro, High Point market, please let me know. Yeah. If you're ever emailing a broker or someone and saying, hey, I'm looking for a really good deal, and I'm a licensed broker in North Carolina, you know what I do with those emails? <laughs> that junk. I delete them. <laughs> yeah. What's a hot deal? Yeah. So I spend most of my time relationship, but being very intentional with those relationships. What are you looking for? What, what is your, you know, and sometimes I'll even be like, Hey, I have an investor, you know, you know, an investor who's looking for a million dollar deal because that can really define out. So if you know, you're looking for a half a million dollar deal, then you need to say, I'm looking for a half a million dollar deal. Not that I'm looking for a deal. Yeah. Well, 100%. And it, it, and like you said, that makes, you know, you want, always want to make the broker's job easier too. Uh, so, but by defining exactly what you're looking for, you're not wasting the broker's time. You're not wasting your time and chances are you're going to have a better communication back and forth anyway. I'm going to say something that you know, but you'll be surprised how many people, I think they understand it, but they don't think about it. Do you know how a broker makes money? By closing deals. By closing deals. He or she doesn't get any money if they ride around with you for six months and you don't buy anything. Yep. They don't get reimbursed for their gas. They don't get reimbursed for their time. They only make money when they close deals. So who are they going to work with? Closers. Closer. People who show them proof of funds, commitment letters from the bank, uh, lender state, you know, partnership agreements showing that I, hey, I don't have money, but he has money or she has money. So if you have that information or you can get it, get it and then share it with the broker. Hey, I got $200,000 in the bank. This bank is committed to an $800,000 loan. I'm looking for a million dollar deal versus I'm just looking for a million dollar deal. Yeah. You'll get more responses with the proof than you will even by defining out the niche. Yeah. 100%. And so lots of our viewers and listeners are beginners and intermediates in the real estate game. So do you have any other tips for, let's say, a beginner who maybe doesn't have a track record or who's just getting started in reaching out to brokers and you know what to do? Yeah. So, you know, uh, yeah, several, several things in that are very important. One, your business plan. And it could be a page. But, you know, where are you trying to do it? Because you said this earlier, people who have been doing real estate for years but never done a deal. Because yeah. one minute they're doing single family, the next minute they're doing land, the next minute they're doing trailer parks, and they're doing strip malls. And then, it, I mean, they're just everywhere. Yeah. So define out your business plan, put it together, define your niche, put an investor packet together. If you're having trouble raising money, it's because... I like this illustration. It's like walking into Baskin Robbins and saying, may I have a scoop of ice cream? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good one. I'm, I'm always a fan of ice cream. So. Yeah, but what are they going to look at you? They're going to look at you like, uh-huh. And they might just stare at you for a minute. But they're, they, I mean, how many scoops? What flavor? Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of, you, you can get it in a waffle bowl, you can get it in a waffle cone, you can get it in a sugar cone, you can get it in a cup, you can get, make it into a milkshake. So, I have found in my own, and I've worked with you know, thousands of people at this point, if you'll go to an investor and say, I need $50,000 for this deal on this side of town, and this is what it's going to be spent on, but if you don't have the deal, say, I need $50,000 for a deal like this on this side of town, here's, the con you know, here's a novel idea. Who's the contractor you're going to work with? If you've never done a deal before and you're trying to get somebody's money, you need to fill in all the blanks, all the questions that you can. Mm -hmm. Who's going to be your general contractor? Who's your plumber? Who's your HVAC? Who's going to do your flooring? Who's going to do your sheetrock? Because if you're asking somebody for money, what are they thinking? Am I going to get my money back? Yeah. And, and so if you'll, if, you know, for new people coming in and, and there's also, this is, you know, that's a lesson for people who have done, if you're doing 10 flip houses a year and you want to get to 20, then you've still got to put that business plan and that investor packet together because you're still stepping outside of something that you haven't done. You've done 10, but now you're trying to double your company. You still got to have the same stuff in line. 
Um, in the next on that, uh, the next for, for people who haven't, or if you're in a situation is don't ever answer a question that you don't know the answer to. Have you ever asked somebody a question, Seth, and immediately before they ever open their mouth, you can tell by the look in their eye, they have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, quite frequently. But what do they do? Then they start telling you their answer. And then you're looking at them going, mm -hmm. my second deal I ever did, I lost $150,000 on that deal. But on my first deal that I made 223,000 on, I was standing outside of a friend's house who had developed 43 food lines, which they're a, a grocery store chain in the Southeast, standing outside of her $2 million house. And she says, Nathan, she said, um, what was the cap rate on the deal? And I kind of looked and, and she's standing, you know, two feet in front of me. And I'm thinking in my mind, is that where the roof comes together in the little ridge vents? And she looked at me and I didn't say anything, but she said, look, please tell me you didn't do a deal and not know what a cap rate is. Okay. But at times we need to just, I should have spouted up and said, you know what? I don't know. Yeah. You know, but I'll find out. Um, so at times it's good just to say, I don't know. Do you, could you explain to me what it is? Because if you answer somebody's question and they know that you don't know the answer, but you try to smooth it over with them, you're breaking your trust with them. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. And, and especially, you know, whenever you're raising capital from other people, you, you have to treat that money even better than you would treat your own money. And they, that person needs to know that they can trust you. And in every deal, something goes wrong, right? There's always problems in a deal. So yep. they need to be confident that you will be straight with them, you know, when there are issues and you know, what's going on, what you're doing to fix it, you know, how things are looking on all that stuff. I, I, I love exactly what you said. That's a great, great point. Even with the bank, that's important. Don't, don't give over false information or misleading information to the bank because if they come back and ask you about it and you can't give them a legitimate answer, what are they going to say? Yeah. No, you know, denied. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. So is there, I, I know you touched on a couple of your past deals. Is there one that really stands out as a Keystone deal? Yeah. So the uh, second deal that I ever did, the one I lost $150,000 on the, Keystone deal of that and, and what I really in my real estate, but my own life is knowing what's going on. Um, verifying due diligence. So, you know, I had an attorney, appraiser, a surveyor, and they all said the property was grandfathered in. So before I ever bought the property, uh, I'm being told, here's your zoning. Well, I closed the next day I went to build uh, to pull my building permits and I was told that two years earlier the property was divided and a built uh, one of the apartment buildings was given to one church and one was given to the other and the setback had been violated therefore the grandfathering was gone oh no so I couldn't pull my building permits so I had an option of tearing half the building down I had an option of buying the other building from the other church and tearing it down uh, 18 months later, finally was all resolved. But, you know, as you go through something like that, you don't know how it's going to resolve. Ended up being able to keep, keep my building. I had to buy the other building. I had to put in a new parking lot. I had to extend the parking. I mean, it was just a disaster. But a one five-minute phone call to the zoning department and saying, hey, could you send me over on letterhead signed by somebody in the office? What is this address and this PIN number? What is it zoned for? What happens, you know, in that to me is I started looking at, oh, how this, look how much money I can make. And if you ever find yourself in a deal saying, look how much money I can make, call me afterwards and tell me how much you lost. Yeah. Because yeah. if the focus becomes money, then we don't catch the things that we should. Yeah. And so that, and, I, and I've had, you know, I've had other deals where real quick, you know, I bought a deal for a million, put a million in it and sold it for 3 million. I and mean, I've had great successes, but those successes only came after I knew the process. And if you don't know the process, you better find a partner, a broker, a coach, or somebody who does 
to help you through that process so you can avoid those very costly mistakes. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. And I know even with myself, having somebody who's been through it before, there are so many nuances and, and just minor things that you can't pick up in a book, but through somebody's experience, they're able to guide you around those, those, uh, those uh, potholes in the road. Who owns fire hydrants? Uh, I, I would assume. You know, it's got to be a trick question since I'm asking you that. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, I would assume the city does. So would I until I bought a 66 unit complex on 13 acres and there was a half a mile of piping and four fire hydrants who had been deeded, which had been deeded to the property in 1967. Oh, <laughs> wow. So I called the fire marshal and said, hey, can you come inspect these for the insurance, which is normal. Mm -hmm. They called back five minutes later and was like, yeah, it'd be $75 a fire hydrant. And I was like, why? I mean, well, you own them. And I was like, what? Called my attorney and sure enough, in the deed, about three-fourths in, the fire hydrants. But even in, in, in home, single home, in HOAs, yeah. fire hydrants can be owned by the property. What? You, so you just got to check it. I learned something new today. I've never come across it before. Who owns that fire hydrant? Wow. Well, I guess if you own it, you can paint it purple instead of red. Uh, no, you, you technically you can you can own it, but you still it's got to be red or yellow. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> that, actually, that, that, I find that fascinating. I, I learned something new today. That's great. Yeah. Wow. So, I, so going back to to the zoning issue. Um, do, do you now have a checklist or, or things that you have to do before you close any deal? Like how, how have you changed to prevent that from happening again? Yeah. So, you know, things now are all in writing, all Excel, all printed out things that these things have to be done. If they're not done, if they can't be verified, then the contingency of time or money or both have to be built in. Yeah. And if you can't have all of that put in there, then if you're doing a deal and those things aren't checked off, there, those are the areas that you can get caught in then. Yeah. So yeah, very, very particular now about how things are done. Like when we used to walk in to verify electricity in a unit, it was walking in and turning one light on. Okay, the power works in here. But I've been, I've bought complexes before where the power worked on one side of the unit and it didn't work on the other. So now it's every plug, every light, every electrical thing has to be tested in a unit, which takes, you know, for two bedroom, one bath, 800 square feet takes about five minutes to check everything. Yeah. But it's $4,000 to rewire a unit. So it's worth the time. Yeah. Oh, I, absolutely. I, I'm very glad you brought up that specific deal example because I think there's a really good lesson in there for people with their due diligence and actually going through the, the process. It's just so unfortunate that, you know, you were told by the lawyer, everybody else that was supposed to be looking out for you that it was the case. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. here's another, you know, um, uh, sewage backup in apartments, older, now, you know, I'm doing class C, 30, 30 35, 40 year old complexes. If you're not standing there when the raw sewage runs up in the toilet or into the bathtub, because it normally comes up and goes bounce, because you know somebody's flushing their toilet, it's gotten caught somewhere. So we go and pull two years worth of housing complaints, because owners normally won't disclose those things, because those are expensive. If you've got to redo all the plumbing underneath the building, that's expensive. Mm -hmm. So we pull all the housing complaints and look at two years worth of housing complaints. Well, if you see a pattern that the bottom units have complained about raw sewage for the last two years, I, you can deduct with 100% certainty that there is a, a pipe issue. There's a plumbing issue. Yeah. Well, that needs to be dealt with before you purchase the property. Yeah. And, and that, that all goes to making sure your eyes are fully open when you're going into a property, um, you know, just so you're educated on, on what you have to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that, that, that's great. So uh, let, let me ask you, Nathan, how has getting into real estate changed your life ever since you were approached uh, back in 2006? Well, so, you know, it's, um, it's taught me a lot of um, good and bad. Um, the bad being it made me deal with some pride issues and being a little more humble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Was, you know, there are mistakes that are going to happen. 
there's things that are going to go wrong. You just have to make sure you plan accordingly. But at first I wasn't, it was all about how much money can I make? Uh, the really good side of real estate is it's something that can provide financial freedom or it can for provide you know extra money to put into a, a, a college fund for your kids or allow you to do things in your life. Um, but the number one thing I encourage people now, because I started out in real estate, it was like, how much money can I make? And you know, at one point I had seven unit, seven complexes, 399 units. I was doing three or four deals a year. But my quality of life, my relationships, my work-life balance was just upside down. Yeah. And I had to really re-gear myself about five years ago of what was the important things in my life. Was it money and building a big business or was it my wife and my daughter and my faith? Because if you make all this money, but you do it the wrong way, then nobody's going to be around you or want to be around you when you get there. Yeah. And so that would be the biggest thing I've learned is do things, do them right, but do them in a balanced way that doesn't affect, you know, who you are or those around you. Yeah. No, that's, uh, that's, that's very well said. And uh, let me ask you, so the, 10 years from now, a decade, where do you see you and your, you and your business uh, growing? So continuing to, to do the flipping, I also, you know, I have the other side. I am a full-time real estate person, but I also do the, the coaching and the consulting and the speaking. And I also have a, a nonprofit ministry called Handling Life. Uh, and it bases about, you know, if you're in constant misery and stress and conflict, like what's going on in your life? You know, really the, the, the focus can't be your money. It can't be your job. It's got to be your health, your finances, uh, your relationships, your personal, your professional. So in, you know, 10 years from now, I see continuing to do property, you know, flip, buy, renovate, hold till the time is right to sell, uh, continuing to help others get to their goals and, but doing it in the right way. Cause there's a lot of folks out there who say, Hey, you know, you can be a millionaire off of real estate. You can, you can also lose a million or you can try for years and never get anything done and, and be worse off than before you began. Mm -hmm. So one of the, so the two goals in there is, you know, continue to do mine, but also help others get to where they want to go in their real estate career. Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's great. Well, Nathan, if somebody's looking to reach out, learn more about what you're doing, um, you mentioned the coaching, where can they find you? Yeah, so they can go to Nathan Tabor and that's N-A-T-H-A-N. T-A-B is in boy, O-R dot com. And then there's a little uh, tab there for real estate. Once they click on that, I've got uh, three um, free eBooks that people can download on flipping apartments, getting started in real estate, which talks about the due diligence. I mean, the uh, business plan and the niche investor packet. And then there's a guide on due diligence, you know, the, the fire hydrant type stuff, you know, the normal rent rolls, leases, but then some of the things that, I would have never thought like who owns the mailboxes. Yeah. It says they're owned by the U S postal service, but they're the property of the apartment and you have to keep them up. So it goes into all kinds of details there, but uh, Nathan Tabor.com is where they can find out more about me. Oh, that's great. Well, Nathan, just want to say thanks so much for taking the time today and uh, sharing some really interesting stories with us. Yes. Yeah, Seth, thanks so much. I appreciate what you do. Hey, you know, for your listeners, so they know, I mean, podcasts like this are a labor of love. Yeah, you know, you're they, not, they certainly are. You're not raking in the money and not, you know, you're not getting $250,000 a tweet like Kim Kardashian. So you're doing this because you have a desire to help others. Yeah. You uh, want to get, you know, information out there and help them achieve. So I hope your listeners, you know, if they don't know that, you know, just from an outside perspective, you know, this is something that you take a lot of time and energy and so I hope people will subscribe. I hope they'll share it with others. I hope they'll take it and, you know, apply it into their business so that they can avoid some mistakes, but also, you know, grow their business. Yeah. Oh, that, that's uh, really appreciate you saying that. No, that Absolutely, man. I, I, hey, hey, if we don't help others, you know, if you want to reach your goals, which is what you're doing, help others. If you're having a hard time reaching your goal, maybe look at, hey, servant leadership is the term. What can I go do to help someone else get to where they want to go? Help them. And as you help others, what happens? Then people want to help you. 
Um, so that's, that's an encouraging thing that you're doing that to help others, man. I, it says, it says a lot about who you are, about your character, uh, about what you're doing is that you have a desire to help others reach where they want to get to. Yeah. Oh, that's, uh, that's the plan. Well, um, th- thanks again uh, for your time. And uh, to you, our viewers, I wish you well on your journey from purchase to profits. See you next time.